happy to welcome uh, Luigi Rizzo here from the University of Pisa. Uh, we've worked together on the FreeBSD project for over 10 years, and uh, Luigi's contributions are many in, in that area, in, involving uh, networking, IPFW, dummy net, all kinds of, of contributions, some of which he'll, he'll tell you about today. And uh, without any long introduction, I'd like to just hand it over to Luigi and uh, look forward to hearing what he's got to talk to us about. Thanks, Mary. So uh, I'm going to present a couple of networking projects that we have been uh, working on in, at the University of Pisa in, uh, in Italy. Uh, the first one uh, is something you might have already heard about, is uh, the uh, Daminet emulator, which is a package that has been widely used in the past and on which we have done several announcements uh, recently. And the second one is related, uh, and it's uh, an algorithm for fast packet scheduling, which is uh, of some importance now that networks have become extremely fast and uh, computers have become also extremely fast. And so some of the uh, solutions used to uh, provide service guarantees are not uh, completely usable anymore. So now uh, to move to the first part of the talk. Um, why do we need emulation? Why we want emulation? Emulation is a standard tool in uh, using protocol and application testing because it uh, makes your life easy when you want to set up an experiment, when you want to reproduce uh, results of your experiment. And also, it's a, it can give much uh, more realistic results than pure simulation as can be done with an S2 and S3 and other uh, simulator that only model the network park of, of the system. Usually when, when you run an experiment on an application, the application behaves uh, as the combination of its component, uh, the application itself, the operating system kernel, device driver, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you really want to account for all these uh, uh, specific effects when you run uh, your, your tests. There are many, many existing options for uh, em emulation. Uh, one of them is Daminet, uh, and other, there are other Linux-based solutions like uh, NISTnet, uh, the combination of TC and uh, NetM, and other tool called NetPath, which is uh, based on, on Click. So is, Click is a modular router uh, project. Uh, which is mostly uh, developed and worked, working on, li on Linux, although there is a user space part. Um, as I said, Daminet is pretty old. I started developing in 97 as a side project when I was doing some research on TCP congestion control. It was included at the time in FreeBSD, and then uh, it was inherited by OSX. In recent years, uh, as part of European project uh, OneLab, we did uh, some extension to the, uh, to the emulator. Uh, most of the goal of this project was to extend the ability to emulate the behavior of uh, wireless networks, but uh, I took the chance also to make the tool more usable and port it uh, to other operating system. As many um, other similar systems, uh, uh, Daminet intercepts packets uh, in various points uh, of the protocol stack. Uh, you, you can pick the one you want, uh, either you're working at layer two or layer three or, or the bridging level and so on. It passes packet through a classifier that decides what to do with, with traffic and uh, then puts the traffic you select through an object called a pipe, which uh, models the behavior of a communication link. Uh, when the packets come out of the pipe after some delay, possibly they are not even coming out because they are dropped by the, the queue, the packets are either reinjected to the protocol stack, or they can go back into the classifier. So you, you can build some uh, complex topologies just by looping uh, through the emulator multiple times. Eventually, you get out of the emulator, and, uh, and you get uh, your, your traffic as if it had uh, traversed the network with, uh, with the features that uh, you configure. The user interface is really simple. Uh, basically, uh, you have just one uh, command that you use to set all, all the things that you need. Configure the classifier, configure the pipes, uh, read back the statistics, and so on. And so here you, you see an example where you can define a couple of pipes, um, number one and number two, which model the two directions of a communication link. Uh, they don't, don't need to have the same uh, characteristics. Uh, for instance, this one, on one direction, uh, we have a 256 kilobit per second and a little bit of delay. The other one is for megabit link. So this could be a model of a DSL line. And then uh, you configure the classifier so that some traf certain traffic is sent to pipe number one, some other traffic is sent to pipe number two. 
And then the flow of packets is like in this picture, packets coming in from the network go to the classifier. Uh, the one selected for pipe one uh, go into pipe one and then uh, they get out and they are sent to your, um, uh, your application. And the same happens in the other direction. Uh, packets that uh, are targeted for the output interface are passed to the classifier, then sent to the appropriate pipe, and then they go out uh, to the proper uh, destination. The main application for this type of emulators are at least the three that uh, we show here. One thing that you can have is just a link emulator for protocol application testing, and uh, this is sometimes uh, uh, just uh, used inside your, uh, your computer, your workstation or laptop, etc. possibly even on the loopback interface to test uh, how your system behaves uh, if uh, instead of a uh, 10, 100 megabit link or gigabit link, you have a DSL line or some, some form of delay in your communication. Or you can build uh, very easily uh, transparent bridges uh, with a couple of network interfaces. And so all the traffic from that goes through your to your bridge is subject to emulation according to the rules that uh, you configure in the classifier. And so you, you can have uh, one, uh, one box that uh, implements the emulation in your network and, and get the, the desired result on the, the entire subnetwork that you connect through this bridge. Uh, another application of uh, Daminet in particular and emulator in general is uh, traffic shaping. Many after I developed this tool, many people started using it not for running experiment, but to sell bandwidth to customers, just uh, according to how much they, they pay. Um, if you're not an ISP, you might still want to reserve bandwidth for certain application and, uh, and limit bandwidth for some other applications so they don't get uh, the entire link that connect your network to the external world. And, uh, Going through this route, if you want to use the emulator or a tool like an emulator in a, in a large test bed or at an ISP, you need uh, certain features that uh, are not needed in a, standard, in a standalone setting. You need to scale to thousands of emulator links uh, or you need uh, extra features to do the classification and the multiplexing of traffic very quickly. You, you cannot afford scaling uh, linearly with the number of emulated links because that would be a very important um, the project I was mentioning before was done uh, in the context of extending the feature of Planet Lab. Planet Lab is a, an initiative for developing a global testbed uh, sponsored initially by Intel, Berkeley, and uh, Carnegie Mellon. And um, there are many organizations involved in, the, in this project. Uh, each of them contributes a few nodes to, to the system and users have account on, on the whole system where they can run a, fully distributed application. Um, Plant Lab uh, is supposed to use the actual network uh, uh, as it is, uh, uh, as a playground for your experiment, but uh, sometimes you want to have more reproducible uh, results or the network, the connectivity that Planet Lab nodes have uh, is very good, much better than, than what you would have uh, from, uh, for instance, uh, customer, residential customer, etc. So you really want to squeeze the bandwidth or apply uh, some uh, modification to the features of, of the link. And that's why we develop uh, a version of Plant Lab that runs uh, within uh, Plant Lab nodes. And in order to make life easier for uh, researchers, we simplified even more the user interface. Uh, I showed before that to configure emulation, you need to set up a few things, not, not many, but you need to set up the pipes and you need to set up the classifier, etc. In Planet Lab, we have a much uh, simpler user interface where you just issue one command, which is called netconfig, and then you, you set the, in one line, you set uh, uh, at the same time the bandwidth of the in inbound and outbound links and the type of traffic you want to, you want to uh, act on, and whether you expect to run a client application on your node, so an application that opens a socket and uh, uh, establishes connections to the outside world, or a server application, one that uh, accepts incoming connections. And with, with this interface, and, uh, and the picture just shows the architecture, how the, the, uh, signal, uh, the signaling and the configuration works on a Planet Lab node. With uh, this, uh, this system, each Planet Lab user can 
define independent emulated links, uh, reconfigure them on the fly while running an experiment, because this, this is a command that you can run from a shell or running system from within your application, etc. And so you have a very, very flexible tool and easy to use and to put on an existing application. So let's see a little bit of the internals of uh, Daminet, uh, how these, uh, the objects uh, that uh, make up the emulator are implemented and what features uh, they provide. The basic object is called the pipe and models only the basic features of the link. And uh, actually the, this was the main uh, strategy in our design of Daminet, uh, keep it as simple as possible and only model things that uh, in a way match physical reality. Uh, we didn't want to implement um, models for delay, losses, uh, jitter, and so on, because uh, first of all, uh, we are lazy. Second thing, uh, we can develop a model, but uh, it's not uh, clear that uh, this model covers all possible situations, so we would need a huge number of different, uh, you know, uh, probabilistic models of these features. And the other thing is that in many cases, uh, some features like um, losses, uh, reordering, and, and so on, uh, are not a feature of the link, but they're a feature of the traffic uh, that uh, goes into the link and causes uh, these effects. So our idea was uh, we just emulate the links and the pipes and the queues, and then let uh, the user generate the effect of uh, using or misusing these, uh, these uh, links uh, in, uh, in, in the way that their application uh, uh, likes to use them. So basically, the, coming back to the link, we can configure the size of the queue, either in bytes or in uh, packets. We can configure the bandwidth of the, the pipe, and we can configure the additional delay, which uh, uh, models the physical distance between the two endpoints of the, of the link that is modeled. We have a little bit of configuration on the queue management policy. At the time when this uh, tool was developed, uh, things like RED or GRED or variation, active queue management uh, um, algorithms were very popular. Uh, now I think they're not very, very important given the advance in packet scheduling. Um, we avoid, uh, as I said, uh, non-deterministic behavior uh, for the reasons said before. We do have some features that uh, are non-deterministic non because they are too useful to be left uh, outside. Like for instance, we have a simple um, random packet drop uh, features where we can program that uh, a small percentage or a percentage of packets is dropped. Also, we have a random rule match uh, option in the classifier, so uh, the, the outcome of classification is not deterministic, but uh, only acts with a certain probability. And uh, we use them uh, to run simple experiment on uh, how an application would, uh, for instance, respond to persistent congestion or, on, or to model uh, um, some kind of uh, uh, packet reordering just by passing uh, through this probabilistic match uh, uh, feature by passing packets to different pipes with uh, different delays. You don't have to use them if you don't like the models and you're free to generate traffic so that causes uh, the effects you want. So the, the classifier, is just used to send the traffic to one of the many pipes that you can define. And we use uh, APFW, which is the uh, standard firewall in FreeBSD. Uh, it has a large number of options, and I've, been done, uh, I've done a lot of work in the past to make it more efficient, more, more flexible, and also to, have, uh, to add some features that uh, make it suitable and scalable to the use in Daminet, uh, which means that uh, we want to be able to handle um, thousands of pipes, thousands of uh, rules. Um, so one, one thing, for instance, we act, added to the classifiers was the ability to have multiple passes through the classifier when, once a packet comes out of, uh, of the pipe. If you want to do more complex things than just sending traffic to a very simple pipe, then we need to split the pipe in its components. We, a pipe uh, is made of at least three things. Uh, one is uh, queues or per flow queues if you want to do some, some work related to packet scheduling. And then it has a scheduler, which is in the simplest incarnation is just a FIFO uh, scheduler. And then we have uh, a link with a certain bandwidth and, and delay, but uh, we could think of adding more features to this uh, link model. So the, the reason of this split is that uh, in this way we can configure independently all, all the 
the features of uh, each of the components and uh, compose all, all these pieces to, together in ways that are not, not possible if we have a monolithic uh, pipe. So the first thing uh, we did was to split uh, the queue from the rest of the, of the pipe and uh, we created an abstraction called the flow set, which is a, an abstraction to model per flow queue. Uh, it is uh, basically a data structure which we configure by defining a, a flow mask, which is uh, something we use to uh, partition traffic in, into multiple flows uh, according to certain configuration of the protocol IP address and source and destination addresses and uh, protocol source and destination port. Then a scheduler, uh, which means that uh, we can attach uh, packets uh, coming from different flow sets to the same scheduler and then uh, we can uh, run a scheduling algorithm on, on those queues. And then uh, there are uh, scheduling parameters attached to these flow sets, uh, like uh, weights or priorities or shares of the link that uh, should be given to each of the flow. Um, configuration of the flow set uh, is, again, very, very simple, one, very simple once you understand the, 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 the model. And here we have an example where we configure basically two flow sets. Uh, one is the keyword is called Q for backward compatibility reasons. Um, I didn't come up with a better word at the, at the time I implemented the feature. And uh, so we can configure, we here configure one flow set, which is number one, uh, which is attached to scheduler number five, and that it has a weight of 10. No, no mask here, which means that all the packets that uh, are uh, sent to this flow set will be put in the same queue, and this queue is attached to a scheduler and will be presented to the scheduler with a parameter, the weight, uh, with the value of 10. Typically, the weight uh, defines uh, how much, what share of the link uh, the, the flow will get. The other uh, flow set, number two, is configured as attached to the same scheduler. It has a mask uh, which says, we takes a few bits of the destination IP and the weight is one, which means that when when packets reach this flow set, they're partitioned in multiple queues according to the uh, final eight bits of the destination IP, like in this example, and they are sent to the same scheduler as, as before, but with a weight of one. So when all this queue will reach the, the scheduler, presumably the, the, the queue coming from flow set one will get a bigger share of the bandwidth than, than the others. Um, Again, uh, we need a couple of rules to, because we have just defined the objects here, but we need, we need classifier rules to send packets uh, to, to these flow sets, and here are the rules. Uh, simple as before, instead of using the pipe keyword, we use the queue keyword, and then we select traffic coming from my PC and send, send it to queue number one with a bigger weight, and the traffic coming from other uh, machines on my subnet uh, and sent to flow set two, which, have, uh, which generates uh, pair IP queues with different uh, and smaller weights. Uh, regarding links, uh, the basic feature links are bandwidth delay. We have a uniform ra random loss feature, uh, which I mentioned before. Reordering is not a feature of the link, but is implemented through um, random uh, probabilistic packet matching, uh, like using a configuration like this. Uh, I can tell a classifier to uh, send packet to pipe one with the probability 0.3 and send packet to pipe two with a 100% probability, of course, uh, subject to the to matching of the other uh, parameters. And then, uh, as you see, pipe, uh, pipes can have different delays. And so when traffic go through, the, the, through these, these rules, uh, part of it goes to one pipe, part of it goes to the other, and the result is that packets are reordered. About um, Mac layer hoverheads, uh, we have uh, many uh, wireless links now, and those are not as simple as the model that we have in Daminet, where each bit takes a constant amount of time to be sent. We have significant uh, um, protocol layer overhead, uh, like preambles, um, contentions, etc. Uh, we have two mechanisms to implement this. Um, one is using a scheduler, because the, the Mac itself is, in fact, a scheduler. And one is used, uh, the feature I'm going to show now, which is called profiles. With profiles, uh, what we do is model the extra airtime for packet transmission. And uh, 
we use an empirical distribution of uh, the extra air time, which in, we inject in the emulator, and then uh, at runtime for each packet, uh, the emulator computes the actual transmission time of the packet and then adds uh, a random uh, uh, value taken from uh, this uh, distribution. And depending on how we set this, uh, uh, these uh, tables and this empirical function, we can model simple things like uh, uh, just the, the framing of, of the packets, or we can model more complex things, although in, non, not a, in a very precise way, more complex things could be uh, contention on, on the channel or even link layer retransmission or uh, eventual losses after a number of uh, retransmissions. In terms of schedulers, um, the original DummyNet only had uh, five for scheduler. Then we added uh, the ability to um, run a specific scheduling algorithm, WF uh, uh, squared Q plus, which is a proportional share scheduler which, with very good scalability and service guarantees uh, features. Uh, then uh, just because uh, we needed to emulate, to make a better emulation of the make layer and then we are also doing some research on packet scheduling. We added the ability to have uh, configurable schedulers in, in, in the system. And so now we have de defined uh, an API uh, using which we can uh, load uh, at runtime in the kernel different scheduling algorithms and then we can configure the pipes to use one or the other type of schedulers. At the moment we have uh, this list of schedulers and other are coming. Um, we have FIFO, deficit round robin, priority and so on. Schedulers uh, differ in the type of guarantees they provide and also in the uh, runtime complexity. So in some situation you want a simple solution, some other situation you want a more complex solution and you're willing to pay the extra uh, computation time. Uh, also, as I said, MacLayer Mac layer is also a scheduler and so we are developing and it's almost finished an 802.11b scheduler and then order will come after this uh, first prototype. Schedulers have uh, masks too, uh, same as Flowset. So when, whenever uh, Flowset sends packet to a scheduler, the scheduler does an, uh, an additional partitioning of traffic and can create uh, on, on the fly multiple instances uh, of, a, of a pipe, or um, actually multiple instances of a scheduler and then of the pipe attached to the scheduler, which means that, uh, for instance, an ISP can, uh, can create uh, independent schedulers for thousands of uh, clients by just defining one, one uh, rule uh, like uh, uh, this one at the bottom where it defines a scheduler, it defines the, 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 the type of scheduler and defines a mask and magically, well, automatically, um, each, each customer will get its own scheduler, its own uh, pipe, uh, which is not uh, conflicting uh, with uh, the use the, the traffic uh, used uh, which uh, other customers are, are using so the the fact that we have a well defined and very simple scheduler api which uh, takes care of almost everything you you need uh, in uh, passing traffic to the kernel like uh, assembling packets um, uh, into mbuff uh, and uh, doing the classification, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, make it very simple to create new scheduling or test new scheduling algorithms, and you you don't have to worry about you know classification, getting the traffic, locking, uh, building a queue, allocating memory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, and then the scheduler themselves become uh, very very simple, uh, as you can see from the line count of the various implementation that we have in the kernel, most of them are. All of them are below 1,000 lines of code, and most of them, at least half of the lines, are comments or uh, copyrights and, and so on. The overall structure of the, uh, this revised version of uh, DummyNet, uh, which uh, uh, links together pipes, flow set queues, and so on, uh, is this. So we have uh, flow set objects uh, which dynamically uh, create a queue according to the mask given in the flow set. And then we have uh, scheduler objects which dynamically uh, create uh, scheduler instances here, again according to the mask given to the scheduler. And then uh, the, the packets from multiple flow set can go to one of the instance of, uh, of the scheduler which is created dynamically, like in this configuration. Testing uh, 
uh, testing code is very important, especially with kernel code uh, where it's not completely trivial to reproduce the operating condition. And uh, some of the scheduling algorithms in particular that we are dealing with are a bit tricky because they, um, there are corner cases that must be tested. Some, in, in some cases, uh, if you make a mistake in doing certain computation, the, the theoretical guarantees of the algorithms do not hold them anymore. So we really need to be sure that before inserting the schedule in the kernel, we uh, we know that the implementation is uh, is correct. And so um, we built some support to run the schedulers in user space. So we, using a system like this, where we use the same exact uh, code that we run in the kernel, but uh, linked to a user space application, which is driven by a packet generator. And the packet generator itself can create multiple flows with the uh, features that we like in terms of different addresses, packet lengths, weights, and so on. And there is a controller which uh, uh, drives the packet generators and pulls traffic from, from the scheduler. And the, the role is the, of the controller is to uh, give us a, a way to control the operating point of the scheduler, whether we want the scheduler to be run uh, in a near empty uh, situation or with uh, queues almost full, etc. So we can try to exercise all the code paths within the scheduler. And the other nice thing of this uh, setup is that uh, we can run performance testing of, uh, of the scheduling uh, algorithm itself without uh, all the extra overhead of uh, packet, uh, either packet generation or packet reception from the interface uh, going to the routing layer, locking, and so on. So we, we can really compare scheduler's performance in this way, which is something that would be very difficult by, by running an, uh, an experiment in the kernel with the entire packet processing chain. Uh, here, what, what you see here is an example of uh, how you can run an experiment by specifying the algorithm type, the uh, low and high threshold of, uh, um, of the number of packets in the scheduler, and the composition of flow sets that you want gen to generate. Uh, with the, you can generate many flow sets uh, specifying, specifying the, w the weight and the number of flows uh, belonging to each of the, of the flow sets. So when, when you use an emulator, you always wonder how accurate it is, how, how well it reproduces the condition, the operation of the actual link. And there are at least three main factors that uh, influence the accuracy of emulation. Um, most of the emulator run uh, off a timer in the kernel, and the accuracy of the timer is uh, generally in the order of one millisecond. But uh, you, you can push the, this value down to very high uh, frequency, uh, so very high values, so we, very uh, low uh, resolution. Uh, we have tried uh, running the FreeBSD kernel with uh, hertz set uh, up to 50,000. It does work. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of overhead in, in, in the system doing that, but it does work. And, and you see in the, in the experiment that the uh, accuracy of the, of the system improves a lot by doing that. There is another reason for, um, that influences accuracy, which is the interference of competing traffic. Eventually, the emulator will receive traffic from a physical link and will send traffic to a physical link. So it, there is no point in having an, uh, an emulator which is accurate to the microsecond when competing, you could have two pipes sending, expecting to send a packet at the same time on the output link because the packet uh, will compete for the physical bandwidth on the link. And so one of them, them uh, might be delayed by as much as uh, one maximum packet size or more if you have multiple pipes competing for the same link. So at gigabit speeds, uh, this, uh, this uh, value is in the order of 120 microseconds, or more if you're running, as it is very common, if you're running a link uh, at 100 megabit per second. So, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to bring the uh, timer accuracy down in the 20 microsecond range when you have an, another factor which is much, much worse here. And the third thing is the operating system interference. Most of the system where Dominant runs are not real-time system, and uh, many kernel activities can uh, take this, lock the CPU uh, for a mounted period of time. And if you just run measurements by using uh, some very um, CPU intensive uh, kernel activities like heavy disk IO, heavy network IO, et cetera, and uh, you run a simple experiment like pinging a remote node subject to that uh, the traffic, you will see that uh, the ping response time vary a lot. Um, they are typically in the order 
50, 70 microseconds, but uh, very, very easily they go up in the 100 microseconds range. And so this is just uh, another factor that uh, uh, hits on the accuracy of the emulator. So overall, uh, if you run uh, the emulator in carefully controlled condition, making sure that uh, you don't put much load on, on the system or that the, you, you bring down uh, the uh, accuracy of the timer, et cetera, et cetera. It's really uh, reason feasible to have uh, 100 microseconds accuracy on modern hardware, which is a, a good result in practice. When, <clears throat> when you run an experiment in user space, the, even the process scheduler itself uh, will give you a uh, much uh, bigger jitter on, uh, on your application. In terms of performance, uh, we have a detailed analysis in the upcoming issue of a computer communication review. Um, basically, the main factor limiting performance is the per packet processing uh, time. And uh, this is coming from uh, three components. One is uh, classifying your cost. Uh, another one is the scheduling cost because when you run multiple pipes uh, at the same time, you have to schedule the work in the in the in the emulator itself. And then there are emulation costs, how much uh, work you need to do to move packets through the emulator from queues to the scheduler to the delay lines and so on. The, we have made a detailed analysis of these three components and the classifier cost as a constant part and then one which is proportional to the number of rules and uh, in the, with the uh, entry level PC hardware, we get uh, times in the order between 400 and 1,000 nanoseconds with uh, up to 20 classifier rules, which is a decent size for a, uh, for a set of rules for an, uh, an emulation system. You shouldn't need more of them because the classification can be done basically in a logarithmic number of, uh, in the number of rules is typically logarithmic in the number of flows that uh, you need to handle. Scheduling costs uh, vary a lot, uh, but uh, all the algorithms that we have uh, have a runtime from order, order one or two order of log n in a number of flows. And emulation costs, uh, moving packets uh, to, to the, the uh, emulator and so on, as a cost which is logarithmic in the, in the number of uh, pipes. Uh, so we have measured times of up to 1.5 microseconds with 1,000 uh, uh, independent fly, uh, pipes. So overall, we can estimate between two and three microseconds per packet on entry level PC hardware. So it, there is, the emulator goes reasonably fast for most uh, uh, application one, one would like to, to try. This porting. So we have recently, as I said, we are porting the code to Linux and Windows. So now all major operating systems have uh, the ability to run uh, emulation directly, natively on, on, on the kernel and application, you, you can test your own application without needing, needing an external box. Uh, when we started doing this work, the code was uh, uh, only for FreeBSD and OS X, uh, and our decision was to, uh, was to make as little changes as possible to the uh, source code except for headers. So we basically built uh, compatibility layers uh, replicating the content of the FreeBSD headers. And then we built uh, uh, a glue layer which implemented uh, the FreeBSD APIs on top of the existing APIs on the other operating systems. And most of the difference are in internal packet representation, locking, uh, packet filtering hooks, et cetera, et cetera. But most systems have uh, a uh, subsystem or hooks with a similar feature. So all, all that, most of the trouble was finding out uh, uh, the pairs of subsystem that were matching in, matching in the different operating system. In particular, for packet representation, uh, most of the time we don't have the overhead of copying the entire packet. The FreeBSD representation uses and buffs uh, and uh, as many other representation and buffs are just a, a container for m metadata and a pointer to the actual uh, packet data. And uh, when uh, we get packets on Linux, they are represented by SK buffs. So when, they are, when we get packets on Windows, they are represented by these packets. And our strategy was the same in all the cases. Whenever we get the packets from a, a foreign operating system, foreign for the uh, dominant source code, we create a pseudo mbuff uh, uh, descriptor which uh, 
is initialized with the metadata from the original representation and with a pointer to the original data. Then all the processing uh, goes on on this uh, pseudo mbuff, and then when the packet is uh, released back to, to the original kernel, we destroy this uh, extra data structure. And a similar approach is used for other, other um, APIs uh, like locking, uh, like uh, um, packet filtering hooks. Uh, the, the, perhaps the most challenging thing was uh, that uh, in some systems like Linux, APIs are changing very frequently. And, uh, and given that uh, our module is not part of, of, the, of the kernel, is an external module, we need the same set of sources to support, uh, you know, all, post, all version of Linux from 2.4 to uh, all uh, variation of 2.6. And then the code becomes a really spaghetti uh, to adapt to the various version of the same API. So you, you can get more information at this uh, uh, address uh, in terms of availability. In FreeBSD was there from since 98, OSX probably 2006. Uh, we completed the Linux and op open WRT version in 2009, and Windows version was completed uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, these are the students who worked on the, on the, on the project, on various parts of the project, uh, in addition to myself. And then, we are moving to the second topic, which is um, order one packet scheduling at high data rates. And the first thing is, why do we care about packet scheduling? A few years ago, people might think, uh, okay, we can solve uh, most scheduling problems by, by just uh, uh, over-provisioning our links. Fact is, now links have become fast, but also CPUs have become very fast, and so it's very easy for a process on a workstation or a workstation on a network to completely saturate uh, one of the links, uh, um, and then over-provisioning is not feasible. And the, the goal of uh, scheduling is to arbitrate access to common resources and give uh, each of the customers of these resources um, certain service guarantees and guarantee isolation in, in the use of these uh, resources. So again, over-provisioning is in my opinion, it's not feasible anymore in many cases, and uh, that's why we need uh, real schedulers. And um, links are very fast too, and so we need that uh, the scheduling algorithm keeps up uh, with the speed of uh, traffic, and so it, it must be very fast uh, itself. Now, in terms of setting, uh, setting the problems, uh, what are service guarantees? What do we care about? Well, um, very often, at least this is the model that we follow, we consider uh, an ideal system, which is called a fluid system, where the communication links uh, or the shared resources is uh, infinitely divisible among customers, and each customer gets a fraction of the uh, available resources, uh, which is proportional to a parameter, which is called weight. And uh, so the formal definition is that each customer should receive a fraction phi uh, i of divided by the sum of weights of all uh, uh, customers that uh, are active on the link at, at uh, that time. Uh, they are called backlog the clients. In the fluid system, because the, the link is infinitely divisible, each, uh, the, the system serves all flows simultaneously, and so you have perfect sharing according to these uh, weight parameters. In the real system, which we call packet system, this perfect sharing is not possible because at the minimum you have to serve one packet at a time. So you really need to define a good sequence, uh, a good order of serving uh, customers that uh, approaches as much as possible this uh, uh, perfect sharing of, uh, of flows. And the packet system has constraints. In addition to serving one packet at a time, one problem it has is it is that often it's not preemptible, and uh, also it must decide online. It cannot foresee the future, and so avoid sending a packet because another one will be coming, uh, which has a higher weight or would, em would end up uh, its uh, transmission earlier in the fluid system. What we do is normally, comp in terms of defining service guarantees, we compare the behavior of the fluid, the fluid system and the behavior of the packet system. And uh, the way we do this comparison is uh, to compute uh, the difference in the amount of service, uh, this is an equation, equations look always good in, on papers. Uh, now this equation, what's the meaning of this equation? This equation is uh, uh, 
tells us the, that our performance metrics is the maximum value of, over all uh, uh, customer, K, and over all possible time intervals, delta T, of the amount of service received by the actual amount of service received by a customer, which is WK over that delta T, and the uh, theoretical amount of, ser uh, of service that uh, that customer would receive on the fluid system, which is VK times W, uh, uh, which is the total amount of work done in the system. Um, in the best possible packet system, and there, there exists uh, uh, such a system, which is called WF squared Q, this deviation in terms of service is uh, equal to one maximum segment size, which means that uh, uh, in the worst case, uh, a, a customer will never be uh, behind in terms of service more than one packet, or ahead in terms of service more than one packet. Being uh, ahead uh, with respect to the fluid system is not a good thing uh, because uh, it leads to barstiness and applications generally do, do not like barstiness as well as humans do not, don't like barstiness. I, I drink one bottle of water a day, but I don't like to drink 30 bottles of water at the beginning of the month and nothing for the rest of the month. So now, this, uh, this index uh, ca captures very well this uh, um, idea of... Uh, fairness in the distribution of traffic. And uh, it's very easy to compute the amount of service received in the, it's easy not in time, well, we have a well-defined formula to compute the amount of service received in the fluid system, so that's a good reference. Uh, also, we have uh, an actual packet system which can give these uh, optimal uh, uh, performance index, which is one MSS. And so we also have a reference of for what is feasible in practice. And so we, we can design scheduling algorithms and see how well they behave compared to this uh, optimal, optimal system. In fact, uh, one would wonder, why do we need to design scheduling algorithms when we have this optimal system? And the, the answer is easy, because this optimal system, uh, there is a theoretical result that uh, says that um, it has a runtime complexity of at least log n in the number of flows, and there is a result by a student of mine in 2004 who came up with an actual algorithm which, mat which uh, matches this uh, lower bound. So log n might be expensive uh, when the number of flows become very high, or the speed, uh, the packet rate becomes very high. And so we need to break, break uh, this barrier, and breaking this barrier implies uh, relaxed guarantees, uh, because if, theory, if the theorem is correct, and the theorem is correct, uh, we cannot have a faster algorithm which gives this optimal uh, uh, performance index. Now, when uh, we relax the guarantees, we can relax guarantees in various ways, and uh, depending on how far we have from this ideal, uh, this optimal value, we have better or worse uh, schedulers. Uh, the state of the art uh, includes the categories uh, listed here. We have uh, priority-based schedulers, which are really fast, but give no guarantees to anyone except the the king, the, the flow with the highest priority. We have uh, round-robin or deficit round-robin schedulers, or variation of them, which have uh, uh, order one uh, runtime but uh, poor guarantees. Basically, the amount of service that uh, uh, is given to the deviation between the ideal service and the actual service can be as many as as large as uh, n times the uh, optimal service which is a bad thing because, again, we, we can have a large barstiness. There, are, um, there is a family of schedulers which are called timestamp-based scheduler, uh, which uh, internally model the behavior of the, um, of the fluid uh, system and try to track it. And WF squared Q, the optimal scheduler, is one member of this family, uh, which give uh, optimal service guarantees in long end time. And there are uh, approximated variants of these schedulers which have uh, order one um, runtime, um, and their guarantees are reasonable. Uh, they're just a constant time larger than the optimal guarantees. But so far, these, uh, these schedulers, uh, the runtime, uh, which was uh, several times uh, slower than uh, round robin, uh, which is the best, uh, you know, uh, proportional, uh, the best uh, proportional share, uh, scheduler that uh, we have. Uh, around. Our result is a new algorithm which is called uh, QFQ, which is 
give the same uh, guarantees of WF square Q plus variation of timestamp based uh, uh, scheduler, um, only more or less five times uh, uh, the maximum packet size, and it's truly constant. The other, the other algorithms uh, that I mentioned before are actually dependent on some other dimensions, which are not the number of flows, but are some other parameters of the algorithm. So in the end, the, their code needs to iterate over some data, data structure to, to perform operation. Our algorithms has no loops inside just because uh, it is based on some data structures which enforce uh, some um, uh, ordering properties uh, that uh, are involved uh, in, the, in the scheduling decisions. And the instructions that we use are very simple, uh, basically, uh, and or masking and um, find first set. There is only one multiplication in, uh, in, in the in Q or the Q operation. And in terms of runtime, again, on my desktop machine, which is uh, an entry-level workstation, uh, the algorithm runs uh, in, uh, in Q and the Q pair, which are the basic operation for sending and pulling a packet to, uh, from a scheduler, runs in 110 nanoseconds per packet, which compares to 55 nanoseconds for deficit round-robin, and over 400 uh, nanoseconds for KPS, which is one of, I think, the fastest uh, competitor in terms of order one uh, uh, scheduling algorithms. Uh, I think the result is important because uh, it makes uh, fair queuing uh, feasible in software at gigabit per second rates or feasible also in, uh, on inexpensive hardware like uh, uh, switches. An overview of the algorithm, I will not enter into the details because some of them are very technical and boring, but um, the idea uh, is that uh, it tries to track the behavior of a fluid system and for each flow and for each packet tries to compute when the packet would start service and finish service in the in the fluid system and this is something that all uh, timestamp based uh, schedulers do um, so each packet is tagged uh, with a virtual start time virtual finish time and the system also tracks uh, uh, virtual system time which is the more, tracks the evolution of time in the in the fluid uh, system. Now the the idea is that uh, we would like to uh, schedule packets in the same order as in the fluid system. So we would send packet uh, um, by ordered by finish time uh, by virtual finish time. The problem is that uh, sometimes uh, when you, we have to make a scheduling deci decision, uh, we don't have. Uh, the, the next packet that uh, the fluid system uh, would have finished has not arrived yet. So uh, we cannot really make uh, the same decision. We have an uh, inherent error in, our, in this process. And the other thing is that uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, too much barstiness, we should avoid uh, serving packets uh, that uh, have not uh, yet started serv service in the, in the fluid system. So basically our scheduling decision is mostly based on sorting, but um, it's a constrained form of sorting because it has to account also for these uh, virtual uh, start times. And um, this sorting step is, is what uh, implies a log n complexity, a lower bound in the complexity of the algorithm. And uh, as in many cases with sorting, you can try to reduce the complexity by uh, you sorting on, um, on um, bounded universe. Uh, so you basically approximate the values and so that uh, you have only a finite number of distinct values. And so you can use some kind of bucket sort algorithm that is a constant time sorting algorithm. But when you do this approximation, we, you have to be very careful not to introduce additional um, deviation in the behavior of the scheduler from the ideal, uh, ideal schedule. So quickly glancing at the data structure of, QF, of uh, QFQ, the um, yellow boxes are flows here. And the idea is that um, when uh, we need to um, enqueue a packet, a packet belongs to a flow, uh, we partition the flows in, the, in, the number of, in a number of groups. Uh, uh, and each group has a, a different uh, rounding of uh, the virtual timestamps. And the rounding uh, is proportional in a way to, the, to this parameter, the maximum packet length divided by the weight of the flow. So uh, the heavier is the flow and uh, the, the smaller is the, is the, 
sorry, the bigger is the rounding that you get. Anyways, uh, the, the partition is done in such a way that groups with, uh, flows with similar features end up in the same group. Within each group, uh, we, by virtue of the features of the algorithms, we can only have a, a finite number of different uh, finish time values and also start time values. So basically, we have a finite number of slots uh, where uh, a flow can end up in each group. So within each group, we can do sorting by using um, a bucket sort, a bucket sort algorithm. And um, for selection purposes, uh, um, what uh, other algorithms do, which other algorithms which use a similar principle, uh, they scan the, the list of uh, groups uh, uh, looking for the, the flows with the minimum finish time and that uh, are so-called eligible. Uh, so they, we look for the flows that have already started service in the, in the fluid system. In our algorithm, we organize um, groups in a number of sets, uh, four different sets, uh, which are represented by these bitmaps, so that uh, the index of the group uh, uh, the ordering of indexes in the group is this, uh, reflects the ordering of finish time in, in, in the group themselves. So when we need to find the, the group with the smallest finish time, we only actually need to find the bit in, in this set with, which has the uh, smallest index. And this is easily found with a single machine instruction, which is a find first set. So the tricky part of the algorithm is in um, managing these sets so we don't need to you know, iterate over the groups uh, to uh, manage the sets and, uh, and organize them in a way that preserve this, uh, this ordering. And uh, without entering into many details, but I mean, the algorithm is, uh, once you follow the, all the proof, the algorithm becomes very, very simple. It just uh, when, you, when you queue a packet, uh, and we'll see it here, when you queue a packet, uh, you just need to find uh, the group it belongs to, which is basically a static decision, insert uh, using bucket sort, the, the packet and the flow within one of the buckets in this group, and then update uh, these four bitmaps that uh, represent the set uh, that we care about. One of these bitmap is the one from which we do the selection of the next uh, candidate for transmission. And um, in the NQ, um, indeed the queue process, we just uh, look at this uh, particular bitmap, we find the first bit set, which is uh, the group which contains the uh, flow that uh, should be served first. Then we go to this data structure, which has a finite number of buckets. We, again, using a finite first set, we find the first bucket which has flows in it, and we pick the, the first flow in the, in the queue, and that's all. After doing that, we need to put the flow back uh, in the, into the proper position, usually within the group, and do some management of these uh, four bitmaps which is easily done uh, using a few um, logic uh, operation, basically masking uh, to move a number of groups from one bit map to the other one. So now we move to the performance evaluation of our algorithms. In a, in a paper that uh, it's on the web page that I will mention in a moment, um, uh, there are uh, proofs that uh, show that the service guarantees for uh, our system are expressed by this formula, and the end uh, result of this formula, once you put in the constant, et cetera, is that the WFI, the, perform the performance index, is uh, within uh, five maximum segment, segment size, compared to one, which is the optimal system. Um, there is an equivalent in terms of uh, delay, uh, which is expressed by, by this formula, but we don't care much about it. Um, in terms of actual performance, running time, how, how fast it is, uh, uh, how fast QFQ is compared to the other system. For this, we use the same uh, scheme that I showed before talking about Daminet. We implemented an actual QFQ scheduler, an actual implementation, and we have uh, actual implementation on many other schedulers, including uh, competing algorithms, and we tested uh, with the system uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, with a variety of uh, configuration in terms of number of flows and uh, packet sizes and, and uh, scheduler status in terms of occupation. And performance data uh, are here. This uh, graph uh, shows the scalability of the system. What we compare here is the baseline, which is uh, this uh, graph called NAN, which 
includes a system where we run the same system as before without any scheduler. So it's just the overhead of generating the, the traffic and driving the, the controller. And independently of the number of uh, flows, more or less independently of the number of flows, uh, this system with no scheduler consumes uh, this amount of time in, in our test, around 60 nanoseconds or so. When we add a simple FIFO scheduler, uh, even just doing the queue, and, and the queue takes a little bit of time, and uh, we have this second curve. Deficit round robin, which is, as I said, one of the fastest um, proportional share scheduler that we have as uh, this curve. And then uh, QFQ is just above here. Uh, so about twice as slow uh, than the uh, deficit round robin. The next uh, competitor is uh, KPS is up here in the 400 to 500 nanosecond uh, range for a pair. And just for a comparison, this is the WF square Q plus, uh, which has a runtime which is logarithmic. And uh, in effect, uh, we, we can see this from the graph because the x-axis is logarithmic in the number of flows. Um, from this experiment, we see a few things uh, which can easily, easily, easily be explained. As you see, most of the algorithms are flat up to 256 or perhaps even 1K flows. When we go up, uh, we, we start seeing hash caching effects because uh, even, even though these algorithms have uh, order one runtime, they touch memory. Uh, the, the amount of memory they touch is proportional to the number of flows. So when we uh, start, the, start running out of cache, the runtime increases. And that runtime increases for all the algorithms. Uh, QFQ has a peculiar behavior with only one flow. One flow in a scheduler is uh, almost uh, always the possible uh, case for operation of the scheduler because all the time you take a flow, take it out of the data structure, and you put it back in the same place after making uh, a lot of useless uh, checks to see if there is some other flow ready for, for service. So we, we could have optimized the, the code to, to look uh, good on, on this point, but then we would have had worse performance in the other points. And in the end, if you have a scheduler with only one flow, you don't care too much about the runtime. So uh, we, these are real numbers from a real implementation. And some of these phenomena you wouldn't see from simulation or from theoretical, purely theoretical analysis. Um, the previous graph showed the performance only with um, flows of the same type. But we can run the uh, same experiment with a mix of flows of different features in terms of uh, weights. Uh, and, and uh, of course, we have different results. And this, this table shows the uh, result of the experiments uh, with the different combination of flows and different algorithms. As we see, uh, the numbers vary. The standard deviation are really small in our experiments, just because we removed most uh, sources of noise uh, from, from the experiments. Um, there's nothing particular to say other than here we can see also the, the growth of the round times in, um, in WF uh, square Q plus, which is logarithmic. At, uh, with a small number of flows, even this algorithm is acceptable. As the number of flows grows, uh, probably we, we really want some of the fast algorithm to, to run. Conclusion, um, we have a timestamp based scheduler which has near optimal service guarantees uh, through order one runtimes, uh, which is comparable to round robin. And uh, this actual code is not just a theoretical result. It's already available as part of Daminet, so you have it on many platforms now. And the code is uh, available at this link. This joint work, by the way, with uh, Fabio Cecconi, a student of mine, and Paolo Valente, who was a former student of mine. And we are planning, uh, in addition to the dominant implementation, we are planning to put this uh, scheduler also within a click module, just because click is uh, widely used as a solution for doing all sorts of uh, uh, networking uh, uh, devices, uh, routers, switches, uh, emulation systems, and, and so on. And future work, uh, we'll look at uh, doing uh, more detailed performance analysis to see how we can optimize this, uh, this system even more. Uh, especially, think of, we are thinking of, we are actually running the scheduler on open, 
different WRT platforms, which are you know cheap uh, access points or system which have only a 200 mega CPU, not much memory, not a lot of memory bandwidth. We would like to see how fast uh, the system works there and uh, how can we optimize it um, for this platform. Also, we want to see how much we can gain in uh, hardware implementation because there are many parts of this algorithm that can actually run in parallel. And so if we if we can isolate um, these parts and, and run, build a hardware implementation, perhaps on an FPGA or in the firmware of some network card, that would be an interesting uh, test uh, to, to make. Uh, so links uh, covered on the talk. You have a link to my dominant page and QFQ and for everything else. <laughs> That's Google. That's all. Questions? Uh, welcome. <laughs> So Marta Garbone was a sum of code students uh, within the FreeBSD project last year. Um, this year I applied uh, as my department, not as a, you know, one of the standard organization. And uh, fortunately, the application was not accepted. I, frankly, I don't know the reason, but we can discuss this offline. But uh, no, I, I, I have been um, trying to uh, encourage my students to apply to a summer of code in the past. And uh, in actually, five of them have worked on several FreeBSD projects. Uh, some of them related, some of them were not related. And actually, now that you ask, there is some other activity we have been doing uh, also within a context of summer code, which is disk scheduling. I couldn't cover it in, in this talk, which was already too dense. <laughs> but, uh, I'm happy to discuss it offline if people are interested. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the theoretical, so, okay, sure. The, the question was uh, how, how much uh, the uh, did, is whether we measure the actual devi deviation of the scheduler from the uh, optimal uh, deviation. Uh, the answer is we did, and there, is, there are some experiments where we show the, the average deviation. We don't have, um, I, I don't remember at least, I'm sure we have the data, <laughs> I just don't remember the result. Um, what is the actual deviation that we measure in our experiment? Um, we have to think that in many cases, we care about worst case because you you, you never know how, how, how an attacker could drive your network and, uh, and try to um, uh, force you to run in one of those worst cases. So it would be great if we, we would be able to replicate uh, those worst cases with a particular traffic pattern. And actually, this is one of the goals of having uh, an environment for testing that we can run in user land with a, with a controller that drives the scheduler. We haven't. Uh, worked on actually trying to figure out what are the worst case patterns for, for the scheduler. Yeah. Other classifiers in Linux or other emulation solutions? Oh, okay. So the question was, uh, how does uh, IPFW and Dominate compare with other solutions that exist in Linux? So um, we need to go back to the first, yeah, to this slide. So uh, NISNet is uh, not um, actively developed, I think, and it's not, none of them is a standard part of Linux except perhaps from TC. Uh, NISNet is not actively developed, uh, it's much inferior in terms of features. Uh, TC is mostly, as I understand, a um, traffic shaper. It doesn't, it doesn't have um, support, for instance, to emulate delays, and so you need an, an external package to do all the uh, delay emulation. And in, 
at least the feedback that I got from other people who are used to who have tried different uh, solutions are uh, that um, this uh, IPFW and Daminet is a lot easier to use because it's really it's really as simple as this. It's really as simple as issuing a few comments. Um, in, the, in all the other cases, you have to familiarize with the structure of uh, TC and how the classifier works and uh, how uh, to add the additional emulation package uh, after, after it. Um, in the other solution, NetPath, NetPath is um, a project uh, which builds uh, an emulator using uh, a click configuration. Click is a system where you can basically assemble modules in a graph, connect them, and then uh, it has a very efficient uh, uh, device driver, and uh, it has a very efficient packet processing path. And um, so it, in terms of comparison with Daminet, uh, the NetPath approach uh, is flexible because you can, in principle, either build or use uh, one of the existing click models to do all sort of uh, emulation that, that you like. You can do some kind of scheduling, scheduling but there, are, there isn't actually, actually a good range of schedulers in, in click. Um, the performance of NetPath solution is uh, better, I think, it, for given the same hardware. NetPath uh, goes twice as fast as Daminet in terms of peak performance. But this is only true if you use it as a dedicated uh, system because uh, most of the overhead in uh, Daminet doesn't come from the processing of the IP, IPFW and, and Daminet. It comes from the uh, network stack. So by the time you use, you use NetPath uh, in, in a standard uh, Linux box, you have uh, all these overhead back in, and basically the performance in, is the same. So um, I, I mean, I'm clearly biased in, in saying that Aminet and IPFW are a lot easier to use, but uh, this is the message that I, lot, that I got from a lot of people using this other solution as well. Thank you all for coming.